Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prosperity Through Multifamily Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Cody Laughlin, and want to thank you, as always, for tuning in. we got a very special guest for you today, uh, Mr. George Abreu. George, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Excited to be on your show. Awesome, man. I'm excited to have you here, man. It's been a long time coming, so uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Um, if you don't mind, man, tell the listeners a little bit more about, uh, you know, your journey into real estate and, you know, how you got started. Yeah, so um, it was probably back in when I was going to college, um, getting my degree for electrical engineering. At some point within those five years, I realized I didn't want to be an engineer. Um, <laughs> so I started uh, reading up and, and looking at other successful individuals and how they built their wealth. And it kind of kept leading back to some some type of real estate. Um, so as soon as I connected the dots and uh, saw that, I started going down the path of real estate investing. Um, you know, while still going to school and, get, and getting my degree, and then uh, ended up graduating, working at UPS in the engineering department, and uh, started doing some wholesale and some flips, single family. Once um, I felt like I had a consistent amount of deals coming through and in the pipeline, I went ahead and I quit my W-2 and started doing real estate full time. Uh, you know, haven't looked back since. I have gone <clears throat> down several different paths. Um, you know, started with a lot of fix and flips and wanting to scale the fix and flips in single family. Um, that's how I came about j and Construction and opening my own construction company. You know, I thought that was the best way to, to scale and we did, you know, for, for quite a bit of years, we were doing 50 to 60 flips a year. Um, and then about three and a half years ago, I kind of woke up and I felt like, you know, for the past, at that point, it was maybe eight years or so, I had just been grinding it out, you know, just every day, you know, in the grind. And um, when I looked back, I told myself, you know, what have I built? You know, I've, I've, I've got the construction company and yes, that's great. Um, I've got the real, real estate company, but it's more transactional, more from deal to deal. Uh, we had done some, some holds, some smaller multifamily, but we hadn't built like a large portfolio of holds. So um, that's when I started looking towards multifamily I actually had a couple of clients that were multifamily syndicators and I was helping them on the construction side with their with their capex and um, started talking more with them and that's really what opened my eyes into syndication you know before that I would look at a 200 unit building and just be like yeah there's no way I can buy that um, but you know by and uh, partnering with other investors and putting the money together like you do in a syndication it makes it possible so um, started going down that path, getting educated and um, got a coach and really learned how the ins and outs of multifamily, you know, because it is pretty different from single family. Um, at least when it comes to evaluating the deals, there are some similar aspects of it. Um, and at some point, you know, I, I definitely decided I wanted to do multifamily, but I was still kind of juggling single family, multifamily, the construction company, and I just felt like I wasn't giving full effort anywhere. So at that point I decided to um, stop the single family altogether, sold off whatever I had left and um, started focusing 100% on multifamily. Uh, same with the construction company. I just stopped doing uh, single family altogether and started just doing multifamily and commercial. And that's where I'm at now. Yeah, man, love it, love it. I appreciate you sharing your story and I, and I love what you just mentioned about, you know, uh, you know, you found yourself being spread out and you really wanted to really hone in and get more focused on a particular asset type, in this case, multifamily. And you just, you did what it took to get there. And, and, you know, I know I was guilty of it when I first started in real estate investing, as most people are, is right. You tend to kind of chase shiny objects or, or you kind of get your hands in so many things. And like you said, you, you, you find yourself not becoming an expert at one thing, but you're just multitasking. And so if you really want to scale and, and hit really achieve what you've achieved in, in this period of time, you got to stay focused. And so that's uh, kudos to you, man. Good job. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's a key. Yeah. So, um, and you know, I, I really, 
was hoping to have uh, the bulk of today's conversation with you to really talk about your economies of scale and how you've been able to grow your portfolio and um, <laughs> And also the construction side as well. But, you know, when I think of you, I th as I do most entrepreneurs uh, that have had the success that you've had, um, you know, I, I think of the iceberg model, right? Where you see the 10% above water and the 90% below and, and all that work that you've put into there, um, you know, to get to this point. And like, it, as you said, you, you know, you got into multifamily three and a half years ago. And if the, if the listeners haven't called on to it, I want to re remind them that you have 1700 doors in three and a half years and that is no small feat by any means i mean that that's moving quick you know um so again i want to kind of talk about that like you know what were the things that you were able to implement in your business once you got focused on multifamily to help you with that economies of scale you know you used a great example the iceberg i mean i spent <laughs> a lot of years um you know, working as hard as I could, I mean, from 5 a.m. till midnight, I mean, I was, I'm a workaholic. But um, what I realized is you can't scale that way. You know, there's, there's only so much one person can do. Um, it, it took me a while to figure that out <laughs> and a lot of hard work. But um, when I went into multifamily, since I already had that experience, um, and I knew I wanted to do this differently. I, I built a team from the beginning, you know, and I, and I put in systems and processes um, from day one versus what a lot of small business owners do is um, they kind of get things going and they create a disaster and then they start putting in the systems and the processes and it's, it's really hard at that point. Um, I've done it, trust me. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that, that was the big difference with the multifamily and, um, uh, I also decided to, to partner with others, you know, with other GPs and, and scale in that fashion and, um, leverage other partners and what they're good at and what I'm good at and kind of combine the two and do it that way. Yeah, that's great, man. And um, that's man, it's so huge. You know, we, we talk about this so often and, 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 you know, you can't, I don't think you can talk about it enough, but it's just, this is such a relationship game, right? And I mean, you, it's a team sport. You, it's so much work to try to do by yourself. And I mean, obviously, you know, you grow in a business um, leading up to this with your construction business and, and whatnot. I mean, you, you know that, right? I mean, you have to have the right team players in place to, to do that. So, um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. What, what, what were some of the challenges that you were going through um, making that transition into multifamily and getting to where you are now? Um, you know, I kept telling myself I, I didn't have time, which I know a lot of people tell themselves that. And it's, it's you know, we all have the same amount of time. It's, it's a time management issue, not, not a time issue. Um, and once I realized that, you know, I was... Uh, actually read the book Traction and that's what kind of made me realize I was going to implement the EOS system in my construction company and when I was doing my research and studying on that I, I realized something came up about focus and I know I spent one day where I just kind of laid everything out uh, and I just realized I was, I was spread too thin you know I, I, I I couldn't do it, um, and that's what kind of led me to just completely cut. You know, I was able to cut the single family out because I had the construction company, so I still had income coming from the construction company. Um, I understand if, it, if there's another single family investor for them to just stop from one day to the next. Um, it's kind of crazy, especially you know, multifamily does take some time to to build up that traction. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's how I got here. Yeah. Nice, man. Nice. Ed, such, such an important, again, you know, such an important part of our business is being able to be focused and driven, but, you know, just have the eye on, on the, the end goal, right. And, um, and really build your systems, as you mentioned already to that. And so I haven't read traction. I'm, I, I've heard that a couple of times. Actually, I think I was talking about it earlier. 
with somebody else and uh, I need to check that book out. We're gonna make sure to put that in the show notes, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's, it's a good one. There's a couple other ones with the same author, um, yeah. Yeah, awesome, man, appreciate that. So, and going back to your time management, once you realize, okay, I'm, I'm stretched too thin, I need to get better at this. And, and what were some of the things that you were able to implement to help you with that time management? Um, right away, I started blocking time, you know, where I'm not checking email, I'm not checking my phone, I'm literally spending, and it'll be on my calendar where I've got two, three hours, whatever it is to, uh, back then was, you know, work on multicam. How am I gonna, how am I gonna build this? What am I gonna do? Um, and that was, that was really helpful. Uh, and that came from Tony Robbins. He's got a time management course where he talks about that. And then um, your rocks, like your, your main goals that you want to accomplish and then making sure that you, so we really want to go into this. I'll go into it quickly, but so, you know, I mentioned the, the day-to-day stuff and how I woke up and it was eight years later and um, it's easy to get wrapped up in, in the day-to-day and kind of lose focus on the bigger goals and your day just gets filled with all these little things and your big rocks don't fit if you let all those little things come in first. Um, so that's what the time blocking is for. You know, you, you set time for those big goals and then the rest kind of just flows around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was first introduced to that model through, uh, you know, Franklin Covey. And yeah. and yeah, same thing, you know, big rocks, little rocks. And, and we tend to, and it, it happens so quickly, right? You tend to spend so much of your time on those little rocks, those little bitty details that really aren't advancing your business or your growth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, once you shed all that and really start focusing on those big rocks, you know, sky's the limit from there. So such yeah. a, such an important, uh, and it's a simple concept, but man, it's just so important. So it, it seems simple on the outside, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think only the highly successful individuals have mastered it. Everybody else kind of gets stuck. Yeah, no, touche, man. Good point. Good point. And I think one thing going back to what you mentioned earlier about having partners and leveraging their skill sets as well, right, is trying to identify what you're good at, what's your skill set, and maybe blocking and building your time around that, right? Especially if you're part of a team, you know, you're focusing on your strengths and not spending time on the things that you're not good at and allowing the other people to do the same, right? So. I agree. But, uh, well, cool, man. Well, let's kind of get in some of the nuts and bolts here because, again, you know, I've, I've been following you now for, I don't know, probably a year or so. Uh, and just watching your growth and, and seeing the, 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 uh, the, the deals that you've been doing, I mean, it's just really been phenomenal to watch. And, I mean, again, talking about the economy as a scale, you went from single family, you know, fixed flip, couple rentals. You had some small, multifamily. And then all of a sudden last year, man, you knocked down this ginormous 1200 unit portfolio. And it's just like, man, every deal that you've been doing after that, it's just like, just these massive deals. I mean, 1200 units, I mean, one can only dream of doing that in just a couple of years and here, you know? (laughs) So, I mean, obvious question, loaded question is, how in the world do we knock down a 1200 unit deal? I mean, <laughs> the same way you knock down a smaller one, um, in a sense, you know, it, it's uh, the same steps, just a lot of zeros on the end of everything. Uh, <laughs> but no, really, I mean, you, you need a team, like we've mentioned. I mean, you need a good team. You know, the only reason we felt comfortable going after something like that is because we had made and built a relationship um, with a co-GP that had already done it and had done it several times. So we kind of leaned on them um, for at least the experience on, on a large portfolio. And then, um, you know, we put in the work, we, we found the deal, we executed the, the business plan, uh, we raised equity, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say on the bigger deals, you know, the, the, the biggest thing I think is, is the equity. You, you, you've got to be able to bring in 20, 30 million versus five, maybe 10 million on the smaller deals. Um, and I think once you conquer that, then it's you know making sure 
you've got a team that can manage it and actually execute when you close. Um, other than that, yeah, I would say the equity is probably the biggest difference. Yeah, I mean that's that's it's a huge rage, man. It's a, it's a whole other ball game when you're talking about twenty, thirty million. <laughs> you know, that's that's the size of most deals that most people are looking at right now, at least you know at my level. So, uh, but uh, no, nah, man, kudos, man. This is awesome. It was. I remember that was the talk of the town when when that deal went down. We we're like, holy smokes, did you just see that? <laughs> so, uh, you definitely got a lot of attention there, which honestly you deserve. But uh, but I like the fact that you mentioned too, I, and I didn't realize this too. You had somebody on your sponsorship team that had experience taking down deals similar in size, and, and um, you know that's so huge when we talk about partnering with people that have experience, especially if you don't have the type of experience. Uh, maybe in multifamily, uh, you know, find those people and partner with them and, and um, you know, find a way to add value to them so you can continue to grow uh, as you've done. So that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the quickest way to, you know, speed it up versus, you know, starting from smaller and, and building it all up yourself. Um, just like getting a coach, you know, you can, I'm sure you can figure it all out on your own, but if you get a coach that helps you, it's only going to speed that up. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And we, we've talked about this on previous shows before, too. I mean, you know, having a coach, you know, as you mentioned, can help accelerate your business, but also can save you from making very costly mistakes. And, and in this business, you know, you learn sometimes through those mistakes, but some of those mistakes can put you out of business before you ever get off the ground. So having that coach is important. So like I said, good, good, good point. <laughs> <laughs> Great point, man. Great point. Well, cool, man. I want to talk about your your construction business, and so I'm assuming you know these projects. You're you've uh, done the construction side yourself with all of your assets, right? Correct. Okay. So yeah, when we talk about like vertical integration, most people talk. You know, you're talking about bringing property management house and whatnot. So you have your construction company, which I'm sure is just a huge value add, especially managing the cost of construction and whatnot. But what are some of the common mistakes that you see most operators making when it comes to uh, putting together a CapEx budget or, or maybe executing, uh, you know, the CapEx plan, if you will? Oh, man, I've got a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the first thing is putting together the actual CapEx budget. I mean, you know, I, I see way too often where a deal team syndicator just throws a price per unit at their capex and they perform their due diligence but really they're just looking for deferred maintenance and not really tightening up those numbers on the on the capex budget they raise what they think is adequate to execute the, the capex um, then they close and they actually well one since they don't have the budget or the scope ironed out they spend months after they close figuring out what that's going to be then um once they figure it out and they start getting pricing they start realizing that oh i didn't raise enough equity or <laughs> you know this is going to cost a lot more you know we're gonna have to cut this out we're gonna have to cut that out um so they don't spend enough time or hire professionals to come in and help them with that on the front end um, that's probably the biggest mistake and then that can run into obviously more mistakes. So to that point, when we're, when we are doing the due diligence, you know, obviously I would assume that I can't call you up, George, and say, Hey man, come walk this property with me. Give me an idea of what the budget, you know, would be to do this. How do we, how do we bring that in to where we can start that process and get a better understanding? Um, and get get you as our contractor engaged, if you will. Yeah, I mean, you could uh, you could reach out to a contractor d during due diligence and have them come out. Um, depending, you know, the type of detail I'm talking about, you're you're probably going to have to pay someone something mm -hmm. um, to to help you put it together. Obviously, there's third parties that do. You know, I haven't quite figured the service that I would offer yet for investors, because it, it's, I don't want to offer the same due diligence that you see with these third parties where all they're really doing is walking the units for you and then maybe getting you a couple different estimates here and there. Uh, you know, I'm talking about actually building your CapEx budget, what it's going to cost 
to the T for your deferred maintenance and then what it's going to cost for all your upgrades mm -hmm. to before you move on past your due diligence, you know exactly what your CapEx is going to cost, uh, which is what we do on our side, but it's, you know, it's, it's time consuming. So yeah, I haven't quite put the price tag on that, but so if you're not going to hire somebody, you just need to make sure that you're not just checking the deferred maintenance when you go out there. And if, and when you do check the, you do need to check the deferred maintenance. That's number one, right? Um, but you need to hire the right professionals to do it as well and make sure you're not missing anything and make sure that they give you a price or they bring somebody that can give you an actual price to fix the things. I mean, I see all the time where, you know, somebody scopes the lines, the sewer lines, and then I ask them, okay, so you've got issues with your sewer lines. What's it going to cost? Oh, I don't know. You know, it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, oh, the plumber just told me we have, you know, a couple cracks over here and that. And it's like, okay, well, what's it going to cost? <laughs> um, so getting the cost for everything, including the upgrades, uh, whatever you're going to do cosmetically and putting that all together before your due diligence period is over. You know, you can always obviously change things afterwards, but you want to have the major items. So if you do need to go back to the seller, you have the backup. Uh, you know, I mentioned the sewer lines. If you've got a bunch of broken lines and it's going to cost you 40 grand, you want to be able to give the seller an actual estimate. Hey, look, this is what it's going to cost. Um, and I'm not saying to retrade every deal. I'm just, you know, you want to discover those really bad items first. Sure, sure. Well, as you mentioned, I mean, you'd rather find that out in due diligence versus after the deal's closed and be like, uh oh, yes. <laughs> we got to make capital calls because we didn't raise any money, enough yeah. money. You know, that's 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 not a good conversation you want to have. So, no, uh, and it, and it can completely kill your 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 business plan, right? I mean, um, if you if you don't do that right, so. Um, could, any other mistakes that you, you know, off the top of your head that you see people making? Not walking all the units. I know most coaches stress it. They, they, they stress it for a reason. Um, you know, I take it to me, the most important thing when you're walking all the units is the actual down units. You know, the seller or the property manager will tell you there's the two down units, but if you actually walk all hundred units or whatever, you'll know exactly how many they are. You know, there's a lot of times where I've walked it and been told there's two or three and it's closer to 20. So, and that's a huge uh, difference in, in price. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. I can imagine. I can imagine. So George, it, you, you released, uh, you put this out on so, uh, social media a couple of weeks ago and, and I'm not asking you to, to, to rattle off, you, you know, some je kind of like general rules of thumb, you know, but uh, if you don't mind, give the listeners like, what are some key things aside from the maybe obvious, uh, you know, big ticket items, roofs, uh, plumbing foundation, things like that. What are some things that we should be assessing and looking for uh, when we're doing these unit walkthroughs? to kind of help us plan a little bit better. The interior units? Yeah, interior, exterior. I mean, what, what are just, again, some things that maybe aren't so obvious or evident that we should be made aware of? Yeah, I mean, I, I could tell you one that uh, got us lately. I'm not, I'm not perfect, <laughs> but uh, uh, subfloors. So we, we ran into a lot of issues where, you know, the, the flooring looked deep in. Um, but the floor, the subfloors on the second story were pretty jacked up, and um, we ended up having to repair quite a bit of them and replacing more flooring than, than we thought we would. Um, but since we were so exact on our other numbers, you know, it doesn't make a difference. You now, if, if we weren't that detailed on the front end, you know, then it starts adding up. Um, you know, that's one that I can think of. Trying to think of another one, uh, maybe on the exterior, your drainage. You know, I see a lot of people miss that. And then you get into, you purchase the property and you've got your first uh, hard rain come down and you realize that the water just sits everywhere. It doesn't drain anywhere. You're in a swimming pool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it causes issues with your foundation and your residents aren't happy. happy and, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about drainage, and uh, I know, man. Look, I'm down here in Houston, so uh, we know all about drainage issues and and <laughs> and sitting water for sure. Yeah. So, uh, huge deal there. Um, cool, man. Any anything else that again that you know? Another thing, like the upgrades. You know, look for little things that you can do to um, add some value. So I'll give you an example. We did a, a property where. The kitchen was pretty enclosed um, and everything else was open nice so and we were trying to take this one up to like the next level like B class so we went ahead and we knocked out the wall and opened up the kitchen to the family room and um, I mean it made a huge difference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so just looking for little things like that yeah those opportunities. Um, would you say that it's important and this may be a this may be a dumb question, but you know, I think it's important when you're putting together these CapEd's budget to understand too where where the value add's coming from and delineating where it's like what's going to preserve the integrity of of the building, right? Uh, because you may be putting in a substantial amount of capex into things that maybe not be generating revenue, but you make sure you don't want to miss them as well because again, you don't want to discover it in you know down the road and it costs you big time in the end. You know, roofs again being that example. Um, you know, what would you, what would be your thoughts on that about being able to delineate, you know, the integrity versus, you know, as you mentioned, maybe installing countertops or knocking down a wall to increase value that way. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've talked about that before, um, especially to the passive investors too. Like if you're going to invest into a deal, you want to know how much, let's say the CapEx is $1 million dollars how much of that one million is going towards deferred maintenance and how much is going towards upgrades that's actually going to produce more income um, or the value or raise the value of the property. Um, just because, you know, somebody spending one million on just deferred maintenance, well, how do they plan on raising the value of the property other than, you know, giving it a new roof or, or whatnot. Um, and then there's also, different things you can do. So you mentioned the roof, you know, if, if you're, depending on how long you plan on holding the property, you know, maybe you don't replace every single roof, you know, maybe you, you can extend the life of a couple roofs and just replace the really bad ones. Um, little strategic things you can do like that. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and that's a, such a good point, you know, um, I, I, I like your point about uh, speaking to the passive investors too, because I don't think, you know, for, especially from the CapEx side and construction side, we don't hear this enough, uh, you know, about doing the due diligence from a passive investor standpoint. You know, you really want to know where those CapEx dollars are going. Because like you said, I mean, if you're looking at a pro forma that has a million dollars CapEx, it's not going to things that are going to increase revenue, but they're projecting, you know, 6% rent growth or whatever, you know, might be a big question mark there. So that, that's such a good point. I appreciate you mentioning that. So, um, but, uh, well, cool, man. Well, listen, let's, let's, let's talk about how do we vet our contractors. And, uh, you know, I think it's goes without saying if anybody's done any type of construction projects or whatnot, you know, there's just like anybody else, there's great contractors and there's not so great contractors and a bad contractor can not only make your life miserable, but, can cost you a lot of money, <laughs> you know, and um, how do we, how do we go about vetting our contractors to, to solidify that? Yeah. I mean, the reason I started a construction company is because I experienced some of that, um, you know, the bad contractors and especially here in Texas, you don't need a general contracting license. So anybody can literally say they're a general contractor, um, which makes it <clears throat> easier to start a company but also <laughs> you know a lot of bad contractors mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of different things you can do to vet a contractor you know first thing is do your research online uh, if a contractor does not have an online presence nowadays I mean that's a huge red flag um, ask them for references actually call the references talk to them Ask them for case studies and properties you can actually go look at. Um, 
ask them a lot of questions. I mean, I've, I've got a whole list of questions you can ask a contractor where um, ask them about their process. You know, how do you, how do they get change orders approved? How do they process them um, from the second it comes up to, to actually getting the work done? Um, how do they keep you up to date on the project as far as timeline, uh, photos, videos? Uh, what else? Payment, you know, go over how, how they're going to get paid and how that's going to look. Make sure you're all on the same page. Um, make sure somebody that you feel like you can work with. You know, a lot of times I've seen this also where the investor kind of treats the contractor like a, I don't want to say an enemy, but like not a teammate, you know, more of like, okay, I hired you, get this done. And it, it really should be a team and, and a group effort, especially in multifamily with, you know, you've got the property management team as well. You've got the owners, you've got a lot of people involved and everybody has to be on the same page. Um, you know, we're, we're to the point where we do week, weekly meetings. And then depending on how much we're doing, we even do daily huddles just to make sure with the property manager, with our construction team, and whoever from the owners wants to get on as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I, insurance, make sure they've got general liability insurance. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. And actually that was gonna be one of my leading questions into that is, uh, and you kind of covered it, is how are we communicating with our contractors throughout the life of the project, you know, is, um, and you, you mentioned that perfectly. I, I like the idea of having daily huddles or maybe weekly calls or whatever, just and, and keeping you a part of the team, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, you're 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 the uh, you're handling the, the big expense items. Right. I mean, you're taking care of the big budget items and, and we need we need our contractors to make sure the project is getting done. You know, that's sure. that's part of our business strategy. Right. So uh, I, I like that. That's a great. Uh, I know there's a lot of the issues that come up with construction projects is um, lack of communication. So, I mean, the more communication, the better. I mean, we, you know, we've got a project management software. All our clients get access to it. We post pictures and videos on there as we, as the project progresses. Then we have those calls. We have on-site meetings. I mean, you know, in a sense, we let the, the client dictate how much communication they really want. But I mean, we can take it as far as they want it or, you know, come back as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I would tell you, man, I, I love for me personally, I think it would give me peace of mind knowing that like in particularly for you, you're a multifamily investor, right? So you're an operator, you're an owner, you know what it is to execute and operate that business plan. And so I, I love the fact that you're an investor as well, because it's not just, you know, opposite sides of the fence. I mean, you're living both worlds, you know it. And so I'm sure there's a lot more collaboration that can, or a lot more easier conversations to be had, right? Because you can understand the operator's perspective as well. Yeah, no, I do think that that comes into play for sure. We make a lot of suggestions. Um, you know, it's obviously always up to the, the client what they want to do, but um, we get it. You know, we're not gonna, as far as change orders and when things come up, you know, we make sure we communicate that with the client and, uh, you know, we're not going to do anything out of this world. Like we're not going to spend more money than, than we need to, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a particular, and this may be a more difficult question for you, but is there a particular like, um, uh, contract agreement between you and operator that you prefer to work under like have you seen uh, uh, circumstances where maybe an operator says look we have this agreed budget ahead of time this is the scope of work here's the money go and just have it done at whatever time or do you do you prefer you know you get uh, uh, payment I guess throughout the life of the project and as we hit certain milestones I mean it do you do you see a benefit to either or does it matter as far as, I guess, run, run by the differences again. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, like we we've uh, we've actually had the opportunity to tour property with uh, 
you know, someone that uh, here in the local community and uh, and was very unique the way that they've, you know, again, they're vertically integrated. They have their construction uh, in-house as well. And uh, what they've done is they, they had a uh, um, assumed budget ahead of time, right? They had, they had the scope of work ahead of time and they said, this is what we're doing for every unit. This is our budget for that. And they, they allocated for the what ifs or just in case they added, I think like 10% on there. But, but my point is that they said, okay, if this is a million dollars for the CapEx budget, there it is. This is the scope of work. We're not changing anything. Go. Um, they did that versus all up front versus, you know, maybe saying, Hey, look, we're going to do X amount of units. And if we, if we pivot or we need to change, maybe we didn't like this or that, you know, we, we do that. Um, and so you, you know, the milestones will change, I guess, if you will. Yeah. I mean, the having as, as much upfront is by far the easiest when it comes to construction. Mm -hmm. Um, it just makes it a lot easier for planning and executing, but um, we've had both. You know, we, we can also be flexible, depending, you know, especially with, with COVID, we've had to be very, very flexible with um, the scope of work and, uh, you know, making changes. But uh, I would say try to have as much as you can up front and, you know, having the budget, like you said, I guess, I don't, are you saying that the contractor gave the budget and said, this is what we're doing? Are you saying the... Yeah, the so, it, so it, was a, it was a mutual agreement between operator and contractor, right? And there was, they, they walked the units, they put together the CapEx plan and they said, okay, boom, this is what it's going to take, right? Plus another 10% just in case. But they said, look, this is the scope of work. This is what it's going to be and go. And then like, you know, it's funny because in, in our walkthrough, he was like, dang, man, they already knocked out this many units. And so it's like those, if you wanted to change something or something came up, <laughs> you know, it, it may have been already too late, you know, because they're already rolling with it. So, yeah, no, that's a great example, man. That's why I stress putting a lot of time on the, on the front end. The last thing you want to do is slow down a contractor um, when they've got a good rhythm going down. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, put, put the time in up front, try to get the scope as closest to what it needs to be and then uh, you got to make some changes try to make it as minor as possible sure 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 and you know I, I'd just like to throw in there too you know um, for the listeners too you know as we're as we're going through this and as we're we're trying to put together these budgets I mean everybody wants to be cost conscientious right I mean we definitely want to uh, you know not break the bank or whatever but you know so it's important to obviously vet your contractors and, and make sure that you're doing d good due diligence on make sure that you're getting a good bid if you will but cheaper is not always better I, and i always believe this you get what you pay for and that's some lessons that i learned the hard way especially when i first started mm -hmm. um and and again on this type of scale when you're doing these multi-million dollar projects i mean even more so you know make sure to have a good contractor you know JNT, make sure that you have somebody that you can trust that has a good reputation. And, you know, I don't know where you stack up against other, you know, people, George, or not, but, you know, I, I would feel much better about paying a little bit more and knowing that I'm going to get quality work that's not going to bite me in the butt later down the road uh, versus trying to cut corners. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100%, man. Um, you know, it's maybe on single family, you can try cutting some corners or hiring somebody that doesn't have insurance or or whatnot, man. But uh, that's the last thing you want to do in multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to sacrifice a lot of things. You know, what if something does go wrong, then you're held liable versus the contractor being held liable. What if there's a big warranty issue that comes up and then that contractor's gone? A um, ton of things that can happen. So yeah, I, I agree with you, man. It's, <laughs> it's definitely, you pay for what you get. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And then I would even argue too, like, especially like you said, states like Texas, where you don't have to have a license, man, look, if they don't have a license, I ain't talking to you. You know, if you're not licensed and insured, you know, you got to, you got to protect yourself too and protect that, the, you know, especially when you're raising money from other people. I mean, there's right. a lot of money at stake. I mean, protect, protect those, those investors money for sure. So, but, uh, well, cool, George, any, any advice that you would give maybe to the listeners who are uh, considering, doing us going down the similar path where maybe they have a construction background and maybe they want to bring construction in house. Um, you know, we've talked about this on the property management side where as you vertically integrate, 
Um, it's good because you can control those aspects of the business, but at the same time, it may slow you down a little bit, right? Because now you have a whole separate business that you're operating as well. Any advice that you would give to the listeners who may be considering uh, pulling that in-house? Um, master one aspect first. I mean, you know, if, it, if you're having good, if you got good systems in place and you're finding deals and you're acquiring them and you're, um, you, you're hiring third, third party property management and they're, and you're doing good on your asset management and then you're hiring contractors and you're managing them correctly. Once you've got all that playing, then maybe bring in the next, you know, whatever it is you want to do. If you want to bring in property management, okay, now, now you're going to focus on that and your systems are going to run the rest, the other aspects of your, of your company. Um, if not, you're going to sacrifice, you know, you're going to put all this focus towards bringing in construction in-house and you're going to lack on actually bringing in deals mm -hmm. or you know, vice versa. So, yeah. Yeah, great advice, man. Great advice. Love it, love it, love it. So what's on the horizon for you, George? What's next for, you, you know, both your investment and JNT? Um, I'm going to continue to scale, man. Um, you know, we're creating more systems every day, but um, hiring more te team players. Um, you know, during COVID, we brought on some, some employees instead of firing some. Um, and uh, I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, just finding, putting people in the right positions is, is huge. Um, and I've done it backwards in the past, you know, put somebody that's really good at something and, and tried to fit them in a position that they're, they're just not good at. Um, so yeah, continuing to scale, you know, COVID kind of threw in a wrench <laughs> in the plans a little bit, but um, it's, uh, you know, I think it's only going to be when we look back at this and everybody looks at multifamily, how it compared to the, to the other sectors of real estate. I mean, it's only going to make it even hotter. So, uh, yeah, man, I'm just going to keep growing. I want to get to those 10,000 doors as soon as possible. You keep going at the rate you're going, man. You might be there in like the next two years, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope you do too, man. I'm excited for you, man. That's great. So, uh, well, George, man, it's been a great conversation. Uh, I mean, totally appreciate all of the wisdom that you shared, man. It's, you know, I, I know the listeners are going to get a, a tremendous value out of this. But uh, before we go, i got a few more questions for you, and then we'll wrap up. So um, so if you don't mind, man, tell us a little bit of what, uh, what you're doing to further your education uh, and continuing education, excuse me, to further your investing. Education in general, or just in investing in multifamily? Yeah, just in general, man. What are you What are you doing just to keep yourself, yeah. you know, continue I mean, educating? I'm, I'm huge with audiobooks. Um, no matter you know when I'm working out, I'm listening to a book. When I'm driving, I'm listening to a book. Uh, sometimes if I'm outside by the pool, I'm listening to a book. Um, so a lot of books. Uh, I try to. Uh, associate myself with those that are at my level or even higher. You know, I focus more on higher and um, surround myself with them and kind of just soak up as much as I can. Um, and yeah, just always be, never think you know it all, you know, always be learning. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. We can always be a student no matter what. What, what do they say? If you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yes. <laughs> so, love it, man. Love it. Um, what are, what are some of the, or what is one of the biggest lessons maybe that you've learned that's kind of stuck with you along this journey? Hmm. It's a good one. Um, man, probably, I don't know, I already talked about it, but, but focusing, you know, just, there's so much noise out there, so much um, shiny objects and squirrels mm -hmm. that you want to go run after. <laughs> um, you know, staying focused is, is huge. Uh, conquer whatever it is that you want to conquer, then move on to something else, you know? 
Um, I know I've said that a couple of times already in this episode, but uh, I just think it's huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and again, I go back to, man, th- those are such valuable points that you just can't repeat enough. I mean, that's why you keep hearing them over and over and over, you know, it, you know, it, they're just so important and this is why, you know, so um, I appreciate that. So uh, my next question, which you, uh, you may have answered in this one already, but any advice that you would like to give to the listeners to help them grow their business? Yeah, I mean, I'll try to give something else other than focus. So once you're focused, (laughs) (laughs) um, network, I know everybody says that a lot too, but but do some real, real networking, real building relationships, um, and it'll take you a long way. Um, You know, you talk about the 1200 units that we closed on, um, without building that relationship, there's no way I do that. Um, So... No. Focus, network. Oh, love it, love it, love it. All right, George, tell the listeners how they can get connected with you and learn more about you. Yeah, they can uh, check out my website at elevatecig.com. I've got a couple different uh, free ebooks on there. And then uh, if they want to shoot me an email, which is George Jorge, spelled Jorge, but I still go by George, <laughs> J O R G E at elevatecig.com. Um, tell me that you heard me on the podcast and I'll shoot you over a couple different checklists of things that we talked about today, uh, due diligence checklists. I've got questions to ask a deal sponsor before investing passively. I've got something else that I can't even remember, but I'll send you whatever I've got. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Love it. And I know that you sent me some uh, links uh, to your social media accounts. We'll make sure to put those in the show notes as well. I think you're very active on what Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, Facebook as well. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. Are- yeah. So, awesome, George. Well, <laughs> well, man. Again, appreciate the conversation, man. Just a, a ton of value here, and uh, yeah, kudos to all of your success, man. Look forward to to continue to watching you grow and uh, and staying connected with you, buddy. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.